joining me today, Chancellor Connolly. I'm delighted to be here. Thanks for the chance to talk to you all. Um, when you first stepped on campus a month ago, what was your first impression of UCR? Wow, what a good question. There's so many things that happen all at once. Um, so early impressions, and maybe I'll remember the first one as I go through, uh, was really well organized. I mean, there's a lot to learn about a big campus from you know, our agricultural operations, uh, genomic research, citrus collections, all the way, nanosystems, I mean, and arts, humanities, political science. Uh, what I appreciated a lot was extremely well organized uh, in getting me the information. So that's more about me than about the campus, but I think it says something for the fabulous staff we have here. They really anticipated what I need to know to, you know, hit the ground running. I was, um, I'll say what surprised me was the natural beauty of the campus. Uh, having spent seven years in Santa Barbara, I thought, well, I've seen a beautiful campus, you know. Uh, but I'm looking out of the windows now, you know, there's just, it's fabulous here with the kind of layers of hills and mountains, the snow on the mountains. Then I was surprised that it was cold last week. I didn't, I didn't expect that at all. Um, the warmth of the campus was an early experience I had. Students were fabulous, you know, people gave me flowers, they gave me chocolate, which is still outside, not as much as when they gave it to us, but, um, and even a bottle of champagne, which I still have in my refrigerator. Um, uh, let's see, the architecture was something I noticed right away. A very unusual, very avant-garde from my standpoint. So uh, lots, of, lots of stuff uh, happening all at once, but uh, truthfully, all good, you know. How would you compare UCR to your, your prior campus, UCSB? Well, we're very similar uh, in terms of size uh, of the student body. Uh, UCSB does not have, though, the agricultural uh, side, which I actually missed. I have a lot of experience in that from uh, previous jobs at Nebraska and Texas A&M. Uh, a big difference uh, between us, though, is that through a set of circumstances and decisions made over many, many years, the UCSB faculty is at least 200 more for the same size students. So when students are concerned about getting classes or size of classes, this is one of the problems that, um, again, for reasons that were probably good at the time, the investment in faculty uh, has not been as consistent here as it has been at UCSB. So that's a dramatic, uh, that's one dramatic uh, difference. I think the other um, difference is there's been a series of chancellors here. Um, and in contrast to UCSB, there's been one for almost 20 years. So, you know, that could be a disaster, but in fact, uh, it has been a big boon to uh, UCSB. It's had a particular course uh, to become a particular kind of school, meet certain goals. And I think Chancellor White put um, our campus on that kind of path. Now we have a plan, now we know where we're going, you know and the train has left the station, so it's time to jump on. And that's the way it is at UCSB. Trains left the station, if you come here, you're on it to reach certain levels of excellence. The students feel the same thing, I think. And I hope our students feel the same thing here. What was the transition like from Santa Barbara to Riverside? Like, you, as you mentioned, there are very different campuses in very different regions. Um, was that a rough transition for you? Um, uh, not not very rough, you know, I get to live in the Chancellor's residence, who could complain about that? Uh, the only thing that was tough was uh, dry air, my nose bled a couple of times, that's, that's probably more than you want to know, um, and my hair has kind of done a whole new thing with the air, I don't know what that's about. So uh, other than that, no, I mean, uh, the things that we're struggling with as a campus, and from what I understand the student body is concerned about are exactly the same things um, that UCSB is thinking about, that UCI, that UC Berkeley, you know, wherever you are, uh, you're trying to be better. You're trying to do better. You're trying to make the university experience to be more fulfilling and exciting for both the faculty and the students. You want staff morale to be high. You want to keep the best staff, lose the worst staff. Uh, uh, so we're all doing that. And so that made the transition uh, easy. I'd, I'd also say the great work of Chancellor White has made the transition easy, easier. He has set a path uh, for us to follow and when I was chosen to do this position, uh, President Udoff uh, said, follow that path. Don't go there with a million new ideas. 
you know, work to help them reach the goals that they have set as a UCR community. So that makes it good for me. In your first week as chancellor, you made some big administrative moves. Um, in addition to those, what kinds of things, what kinds of problems um, have you identified that you would like to sort of rectify? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, um, yeah, thank you for noticing. It's, it's good to do something big and be noticed for it. I think we probably have a few more of those to do um, uh, that were, uh, and, and we'll move on them because they're in line with um, our um, uh, strategic plan. One um, that I can share with you is that we'll probably, uh, not probably, we will um, uh, have our budget person um, be moved to be a direct report to the academic side of the house so that uh, we can be sure that when we're making budget decisions that students and faculty are at the center of those decisions. Um, I think we have to um, accelerate our commitment to um, our athletic program uh, in terms of the C Center. Uh, I think the city wants that, the county wants that. I've heard from students, uh, you can tell me if uh, you hear differently, uh, that they want that. Um, and certainly the athletic program wants that. And so I see that that will be an important uh, driver for um, uh, student enjoyment of campus, uh, you know, promoting the success of our athletic program, and very importantly, bringing the bringing the community to UCR. Because when people come here, they're going to love it. It's when they when they're not here that they wonder, well, what are they doing over there? And they'll come for basketball, they'll come for baseball or soccer or any number of our sports, and then they'll learn about the research that's going on across campus, and they'll learn about the incredible amount of student uh, generated service that's in the local region and the world. And I think that'll spur even greater support. For UCR. Um, one of the central themes in your welcome event um, last uh, earlier in the month um, was seeking admission to the AAU. Yes. Um, why is that an important goal for a university like UCR? Uh, there's a couple of reasons uh, and I'll start by saying it's not that I buy into every aspect of AAU. Sometimes I've been a little annoyed at some of their decisions. However, um, Six of the UC campuses are already AAU. We're the University of California. We should be at the table with them, number one. Number two, being in the AAU gives you a preferred status in getting federal um, grants uh, and contracts. So we shouldn't be outside that circle. We should be in the inside group, not the, out, not the outside group. Um, it will help us uh, in the long run in terms of recruiting especially senior faculty and, senior, and administrators. Because people want to come to one of those 60 universities uh, uh, because then they know they're in the elite group. So, uh, and then the last thing I'd say is that it adds to the value of a degree. It, students are not so aware of it, but at the end of the day, uh, five years into the career, 10 years into the career, when you start talking about the university you came from, you want to talk about uh, the fact that your campus is one of those elite U.S. Uh, universities. And so I think it's good um, for all of us. Uh, it's, a, it's a big hill to climb, uh, but I'm convinced UCR can do it. Um, how might UCR climb that hill? Uh, much has been made about uh, hiring additional faculty, um, but with, you know, obviously the, the budget circumstances of the past several years, um, you know, faculty has been a big concern, especially on this camp right. campus. Mm -hmm. um, how, how might we achieve that? Well, I think uh, the good news is that uh, with the passage of Prop 30, and thank you students for uh, uh, getting uh, what, four or 5,000 people uh, registered to vote, um, counting on that almost all of them voted for Prop 30, um, uh, we know we will face cuts. Some of the reason that we couldn't hire faculty was because we didn't know what was going to happen. And if you don't know what's going to happen, you can't hire because most of our expenses are actually in faculty salaries or salaries in general. So uh, with the promise that in fact we'll have a 5% increase, a 5% increase, then a 4%, then a 4%, that's the plan, um, then we know that we can release some of these uh, FTE or faculty lines that we've been holding because we didn't, we were afraid that we'd have to give them up for another set of cuts. So we actually can hire. Um, so there's that. There's some available uh, faculty lines. 
We also have to um, make sure that the decisions we make about the money we have are always prioritized toward um, student welfare, faculty welfare, and that's why I mentioned earlier the shift to uh, a, a reporting process where the, uh, the chief uh, financial officer will report to the academics. Um, so we uh, uh, will we'll use that. Now, I mean, it's a pie, right? It's a, it's a somewhat limited pie at the moment. Uh, but we've already stopped one five-year project that would have cost $6 million, and we intend to invest that money that's up six million dollars over time, not every year, but over a five-year period. We intend to invest that money in uh, faculty. I think there'll be other things like that uh, that we'll do. Um, uh, and we'll also be instituting this year, and you might ask to see how you could gain some access to it, um, a much uh, transparent budget process. Uh, there wasn't any point in doing that when you didn't have any money and you were afraid of cuts, but now that we know that at least we're stable, and by the way, we haven't gotten any money back, but we are stable, um, that we can actually have people come and talk about their budget priorities. And we can make as a group a decision whether or not they line up with students getting more classes, students having the faculty that we need. Are they moving us toward AAU? Are they moving us toward uh, greater uh, diversity student success, greater community engagement, you know, all the pillars of the uh, UCR 2020 plan. So I think, um, and I, you know, I called our budget a pie, but part of the AAU success will be more, um, six, more grant money coming in, mainly from federal sources, but also contracts and grants from uh, corporations. You know, we have a new vice chancellor for research and economic development, and the fact that we put economic development in there, and that was uh, Chancellor White's um, creative genius there is a sign that we're looking more broadly than just government contracts. We're looking for private partnerships as well. And we've had some really success, so I'm, I'm very enthusiastic about that and optimistic. Um, at last week's Regents meeting, there's been a lot of conversation about um, what the impact of the additional state funding is going to be. Um, how do you assess that additional funding is going to impact UCR specifically, uh, and particularly uh, UCR students, uh, or UC students tuition? So we, um, uh, well first of all, we haven't been able to figure out exactly how it will affect UCR specifically because there's still a lot of unknowns, you know, but the, the governor's preliminary budget is pretty broad stroke. Um, uh, we think it will be good, <laughs> so that's good. <laughs> it's a long time. Well, well that brings up another uh, important topic that was discussed uh, and is on a lot of students' minds, and that's online courses. Yeah. Now, coming from uh, an education background, that is your particular area of expertise, what, what do you make of online courses so far, and, and how do you feel about the discussions that were made last week about them? Um, I feel, uh, I, I know a few things from the, my pr previous experiences. Many students, especially highly motivated students, do great uh, online courses. They don't do better, but they do as well. You know, many professors say, if I teach 400 students in a big lecture hall, when I get past the second row, I'm doing distance education, right? You know, so, <clears throat> so here's what I think uh, would be great for our students at UCR. Uh, that if they couldn't get into, well, first of all, if they had the preference for online, and some people do, they want to sit up late at night in their pajamas and they want to do it, and they somehow they, you know, they flourish in this kind of environment. And you know, the best online courses are highly interactive. You know, you actually do more talking with your classmates than um, normally in a face-to-face -face course. So I want us to have enough courses so that students can choose the ones who want to can choose to take those and keep moving toward their degree. I want every course that has been a bottleneck on our campus um, to have an online option so that nobody loses a quarter uh, because they can't get into a particular uh, course. And um, looking down the road and thinking with my financial hat on, the plan is that every campus would develop a certain number of general education courses and that there would be a UC-wide catalog so our students could take some courses from UCSB or UCI or whatever, wherever and other students, uh, students could, across the system could take courses uh, from us. So I would like us to develop a small suite of courses where students from all over the system would say, I want that course from UCR. You know? um, that'd be good for us, uh, and probably good for us financially. 
and good for our reputation as well. So I see this, and I think the regions see this in the first phase, is not a money-making deal for us as a system. It is a way to make sure students get the courses they need at the time they need them. It's also, I think, a prod to the system to make transfer of courses easier so that you should be able to go up to UCSB, take a summer course, should be no question that it transfers back here. But today there is a question, you know, because we don't have those systems in place. So this online press from the governor will certainly help us develop online courses, but I think it will do a few other good things. And the number one for me would be a more open and seamless, really tr transparent um, course um, counting across the system, the, ten, the nine general campuses. As I'm sure you've heard, uh, UCR's former chancellor, Timothy White, had a very close relationship with students. Mm -hmm. um, in your opinion, how would you describe the ideal relationship between the chancellor and the student? Well, um, it's not really for the students to describe what's ideal. You know, for me, I'd say from my standpoint, it would be uh, easy access. The students know that they can walk in here, and unless, you know, president of the system is sitting in here, I'm always going to see a student, number one, um, that I have a way to hear diverse voices, because, you know, students don't speak in one voice. Um, uh, the students would understand um, and would challenge me and challenge any member of the administration that the goal is to make um, every decision in, um, in service of the academic and the research programs um, from, I mean, and every decision in that way, and students should be able to ask questions, well, why, why that, and, and, not, and not this. So to me, ideal is open, frequent um, uh, interaction, uh, and a, a level of trust, but that has to be built. You know, there might be times where, uh, and as I know, uh, Chancellor White had, uh, during the Occupy movement last year, he really trusted the students to do the right things. Um, and, but he built up that trust over time. And, you know, so I'm going to be working on that. Um, what do you hope to accomplish by the end of your interim chancellorship here at UCLA? Well, number one, I hope that I will help um, the campus get the very best uh, possible uh, permanent chancellor. That's, and the second thing is that uh, given the plan and the benchmark set in the plan, that we would look back at the six months or 12 months, however long it takes, and say, we kept moving. You know, Tim left, but, uh, and there are lots of gaps because he left. I, I can't fill his shoes for sure. But in terms of the plan, uh, we didn't miss any steps. So that's what I hope I can say. And there's lots of specifics underneath it. And I've been talking to the vice chancellors and the deans. I'll meet with the deans and vice chancellors again on Thursday, and we'll be looking very specifically, for example, at a student concern that came up about advising. Uh, what are we doing about it? What's the plan? How are we going to get uh, more advisors? Because that's a key element in helping students make good choices and uh, keep making uh, productive progress on their um, academic plans. What would you say things like the AAU and like athletics and things like that also work in, into your? Yeah, absolutely. Because the uh, AAU is um, you know that's central to the UCR 2020. I think uh, Chancellor White and I saw, see, both see athletics as a driver in that way. You know, athletics isn't uh, as important as academics, but athletics brings students to campus, and I heard student leadership say they wanted that. They wanted more students on campus in the evenings, and they wanted more connection to the school. Um, uh, there's nothing like, a, you know, every university wants excited alums, so there's nothing like a great athletic, athletic program that keeps alums excited and connected to their um, university. And, you know, we know that people give money to athletics, but they also um, share their wealth and their time and their um, positive feelings to the whole university when they do that. So that's why I spent the afternoon with uh, three of our best athletic supporters who've given you know, a total of many hundreds of thousands of dollars um, to athletics. But they care very much about genomics, and they care very much about the arts. And somebody talked about, told me that we had the only PhD in dance. So these are people who know about the university, and we need to be telling their story. In fact, one said that she'd heard on an NPR story that we've done the best research on hummingbirds. Who knew that? Who knew that? 
I love hummingbirds, so I'm excited to be here. Um, is there anything in particular you'd like to say to the student body? Well, I'd like, what a good question. Uh, so many things. I, mean, I guess one thing is that, um, you know, I've spent my career as a psychologist, a professor, and now administrator, but I got into this because I loved the idea of figuring out how um, students could learn best, and that would be students, who, some who had disabilities and some who were highly creative and genius. You know, what, what's the environment and the resources that have to be presented so that everybody reaches a level of optimal functioning and that they're happy with their lives, that they find joy in what they do. Um, so this is a opportunity for me to try to you know, play that out in the real world and I'd want students to know that, that I'm looking for ways to enhance their experience, um, but I won't be able to figure it out uh, alone. I'll, I'll need to get input um, from them and you know, ideas about things to do, but also corrective feedback along the way. So, you know, I'd like, I'd like them to hear and uh, believe that we're in this together. Chancellor Connolly, thank you very much for taking the time to speak with us today. Anytime. Great.